I'm Larry Jacobs, and I'm a faculty at the University of Minnesota. And I want to welcome you to this conversation, which is convened by the Center for the Study of Politics and Governance and the Humphrey School of Public Affairs at the University of Minnesota. This is part of an ongoing uh, series of conversations that the Humphrey School and the Center for the Study of Politics and Governance have been conducting for a number of years, we usually it's several dozen a year. And we try to bring together policymakers, politicians, policy experts, and generally smart people about politics. Uh, so we wanna welcome you to that. And I wanna just let you know that one of our traditions is to include you. If you've got questions, if you've got concerns, uh, outrage, please let us know. We're gonna try to get to as many questions as possible. Rather than stopping and doing a kind of traditional Q&A process, I kind of filter in the questions and the comments uh, into the conversation. So it's a little more, it's a little smoother. You'll see at the bottom of your page, there's a Q&A button, and that's how you uh, uh, add your questions, your comments, your observations. And again, we welcome that. We will try to get as many as possible. Um, thank you. I want to say a word about our upcoming programs. Uh, if you're interested in what else we'll be doing, uh, we've got some really terrific programs uh, coming up um, on well, next Wednesday. We've got the Senate Majority Leader, Paul Gazelka, joining us. He is the Republican uh, official who has the highest ranking in Minnesota, uh, very thoughtful. He's been uh, raising questions about how Governor uh, Tim Waltz has been conducting the, um, the coronavirus uh, containment policy, but I would say generally it's been a conversation rather than a shouting match. So join us for that. That'll be very interesting. Um, coming up after that, we have um, a program on voting at home, voting by mail. Uh, you've obviously been hearing a lot about that. One of the things that the Center for the Study of Politics and Governance has started is the first online nationwide uh, program in election administration training. And this uh, seminar, webinar, it's coming up um, May 5th, uh, is part of that series. If you're interested in knowing more about the vote by mail or voting at home, this would be a great opportunity uh, to go a little deeper on that. And then coming up uh, in about a month's time, we're very pleased to have uh, Vin Weber and Anna Greenberg. Uh, Vin is a prominent Republican strategist, a former member of Congress, and Anna Greenberg is one of the uh, most widely respected and admired um, democratic political strategists. They're also good friends, which uh, will make this a particularly interesting conversation about the upcoming elections here in the United States. Okay, very excited about today's program, uh, which we've been thinking about for some time. Obviously, uh, Democrats, Republicans disagree and now we're starting to see or have been seeing real signs of something more intense and and different than just disagreement we actually seeing hatred and it's filtering through a number of um, uh, different aspects of our country and certainly the coronavirus response we're going to get to all that today we've got a terrific uh, group of guests who we're grateful are joining us Ramesh Ponaru. Um, is a senior editor at the National Review. He is a visiting uh, fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. He's a columnist for Bloomberg News, and you'll also see him published in the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal. He is one of the most widely respected and I would say brilliant columnists that we have in the country. Um, and I'm excited to have him uh, with us. Um, we're also very pleased to have with us Professor Sh Professor Shanto Ayengar, who is at Stanford University. Um, he's in the political science department. He holds the Harry and Norman Professor. Um, he's also a senior fellow at the Hoover Institute. He's written a handful of books um, and many articles. He's one of the most influential uh, scholars of public opinion, political communications, and partisanship. Um, thank you both for joining us. Uh, Professor Ayenga, I want to start with you. Um, first, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, my pleasure, my pleasure. Um, 
Uh, we have seen in the recent era um, several different cycles of partisanship. Into the 1960s um, and maybe part of the 1970s, we saw much more kind of um, uh, pragmatic uh, partisanship where boundaries would shift. You'd see coalitions across party lines. It wasn't unusual to see Medicare, for instance, passed by Democrats and Republicans. Civil rights, of course, uh, brought on a number of Republicans who were leaders in passing civil rights legislation. Um, the second era, which is a bit more recent over the last several decades, was the sorting of uh, liberals and, and conservatives into the Democratic and Republican parties. We've seen a profound divergence over ideology with liberals and, and liberal Democrats and conservative Republicans going at, uh, after each other. You've pointed to a third uh, uh, to, uh, kind of evolution in um, our partisan um, uh, attitudes. Can you talk a little bit about some of your findings and why they are so distinctive for this moment? Uh, sure, uh, and, and thanks for the, uh, the kind introduction, uh, Larry. Uh, so, yes, as you've uh, as you've just indicated in your opening remarks, the the, the composition of the two political parties has profoundly uh, changed. Uh, they are now extremely homogeneous in terms of their political point of view. Uh, the Democratic Party is clearly the party on the left. Uh, the Republican Party is clearly on the right. But what has been unnoticed in this uh, transformation is a different kind of change in the outlook of people who support the Democratic and Republican parties. The people we, we in political science that we call people who have a sense of party identification and call themselves Democrats or Republicans. And this, this change has to do with their feelings about their political opponents. So in the 1960s and the 1970s, uh, partisans pretty well, they got along. I mean, they didn't see each other as, as enemies. They did not see each other. They didn't denigrate uh, their opponents. But today, it's just the opposite. Uh, today, we live in an era of uh, just super animus. A lot of partisan animus. Uh, a lot of, uh, I mean, I, I think the title of this session is Hatred. I don't think hatred is, is uh, exaggerating. Uh, so how did this all come about? Well, it's a very uh, complicated story, but what I'd, what I'd like to do in, in the brief time I have is just summarize some of the evidence documenting this nature of this divide. And then perhaps when we, when we have a general discussion, we, we can consider you know, what are the factors that may have contributed to this rather depressing state of affairs. And I have to warn the audience that <laughs> the results and the evidence I'm about to present, uh, they are really are quite depressing. Uh, and uh, you, you're probably not gonna go away <laughs> with a very uplifted sense of uh, the future of American society or the American body politic. Okay, so shall I, shall I begin? Yes. Okay, so uh, most of the evidence on this, this fear and loathing across the party divide, if you will, most of the evidence is in the form of survey data, you know, you know, surveys where people have been asked, you know, how do you feel about the Democratic Party or the Republican Party? And how do you feel about people who tend to vote Democratic or tend to vote Republican or who are active in one set of organizations or another? And so we have these questions that have been asked by the American National Election Studies, which is the premier survey organization of the political science discipline. And this, these surveys go all the way back to the 1960s. And so we can track uh, partisan sentiment over time. And when you do that, you notice that beginning in the late 1980s and early 1990s, Republicans and Democrats begin to voice, um, you know, pretty harsh sentiments uh, toward their opponents. I don't want to get into the details of the exact questions that are asked, but you can take my word for it. Uh, the evidence is pretty overpowering that since the early 1990s, there's a very clear willingness to express uh, harsh, critical sentiments uh, toward political opponents. Uh, so much so that today, the level of animus directed across the party divide exceeds the level of animus based on any other division or cleavage you can think of. Uh, 
including what most people consider, you know, sort of the gold standard in terms of uh, divisions, um, and that is race. Uh, so partisan animus today exceeds animus uh, based on race or ethnicity. Uh, so put it, uh, if you want to put it differently, uh, you, could, you can think about it. Uh, racism is typically the way we describe bias, uh, biased attitudes based on race or ethnicity. Today, you might say partyism, partyism exceeds uh, racism. Mm. So that's, that, 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 that covers so much the, the, the political front. Political attitudes are now characterized by this deep sense of ill will. The problem is that it has now spilled over. It is far, it, it extends far beyond the political domain. Uh, party and party prejudice is now characterizing our daily interpersonal interactions, our social lives, uh, what we do in our spare time. I'll just cite one example because it's pretty striking. And that has to do with our selection of spouses. To what extent are people uh, dating and marrying on the basis of political agreement? That's a really interesting question because we, again, we have data on, on the political attitudes of, of, of family members. There's a classic study that was run in the 1960s, in 1965 to be precise, which surveyed a representative sample of high school seniors and also surveyed their mothers and their fathers. So we could estimate what is the extent to which the parents agreed. And you might be surprised to learn that in 1965, it was barely 60% of the couples that were surveyed had the same political affiliation, indicating that politics was not a big deal. <laughs> People were not going out of their way to find someone they agreed with uh, to, to, to you know, spend the rest of their life or, or to just, you know, social relations were not constrained by politics. Today, well, we've replicated that study a couple of years ago, and today the level of homogeneity in the American, in American society is on the order of magnitude of 85%. Wow. The party registration agreement is almost, I mean, there's almost a consensus. And there are some really cool uh, studies because of, you know, we have now have these online dating sites and we've got a lot of uh, data on what happens at those sites. And a couple of uh, my colleagues at the Stanford Business School have published uh, some really interesting papers showing that even though uh, people at online da dating sites are quite strategic about revealing their political views, I mean, they don't advertise that, oh, I voted for Trump in 2016. They don't want to constrain the market. So they tend to conceal their political views. Nonetheless, it turns out that the top predictor of who matches at these online dating sites is political ideology. So that's a really striking uh, phenomenon. So you can let, see let that today, on. sure. Let me hold you there, because I want to bring Ramesh into the conversation, and then we'll go back. And I know, and I can assure all of you, uh, I've read Chantal Yengar's research for decades, and this is deep. Um, and we're going to get to more of that. If you want to see it yourself, just Google Chantal Yengar, and, um, be prepared to spend a number of weeks reading, uh, and you will be uh, rewarded amply. Um, Ramesh Ponaru, I want to come to you. And I was um, reading a, uh, an article that was written um, by the alumni magazine at Princeton, which is where you graduated from. And in it, it talked about uh, your attempt to defend the Burkean conservative tradition from the Breitbart fed invaders, namely the Trump folks. And the, the Burkean approach or conservatism tends to be quite intellectual and principled, uh, tends to focus on individual liberty. Um, and I would say social identity and social issues are important and as they have been for you. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'd, I'd welcome your reactions to what um, Chantal Yengar has just described and your effort to kind of walk through this minefield of being a principled conservative who calls the shots as you see them, but also in a world that is not only divided by policy issues and ideology, but now by partisan hate. Thanks. Um, thanks for that question. Thanks for uh, making me a part of this. I have 
spoken to um, Humphrey Institute uh, audiences uh, in the DC area and in Minnesota, but I think this is the first time I've done it from the DC area to Minnesota. So uh, it's a first for me. Thanks for facilitating that and for um, uh, bringing me into contact with, uh, with Chanteau's work, which I think helps fill in some of the some of the detail and numbers of things that we're all experiencing and that I've certainly um, experienced in my own professional life um, as a political journalist who's been covering national politics now for about 25 years. Uh, and I think that uh, it is something that you have really seen develop and um, uh, become uh, more and more intense over time. Uh, we have um, a politics that is highly polarized. Uh, it, is a, it is negatively polarized. That is, each coalition um, is held together less by any philosophical principle or policy objective than it is by animosity toward the other side, and importantly, animosity toward the other side's coalition. Um, just to add a little bit more sort of uh, texture to that, it also strikes me that in both cases, these coalitions view themselves as being kind of natural or silent majorities of the country already. That is, they, and it's partly because they're surrounded by so many like-minded people, it's a very easy assumption to fall into. Uh, and so um, I think I may have even mentioned this the last time I was out in, uh, uh, the university that the inaugural day weekend um, events in 2017 really illustrated this, where you had President Trump spokespeople ludicrously insisting that this was there was record turnout, which is I think important to their conceit that they speak for the people, all the real Americans in the country. But you also had these counter protests, the the um, the March for Women that day, which was a really impressive feet of mobilization in America's largest cities, but was also misleading in letting people, making people think that, you know, sort of they spoke for a majority of the country. And if both sides think they already have a majority, it, two things follow. One, you don't have to persuade people who don't already share your views. And two, if you suffer political setbacks, it's because of something unfair, something illegitimate that has happened. Um, on the right, it tends to be, you know, deep state or the media or voter fraud has stolen these elections from you. And on the left, it's the Koch brothers, um, it's the Russians, uh, it's dark money. Um, but uh, in, in both cases, I think that this moves us away from a, a healthful politics. Um, it is certainly the case that those of us who uh, are on the right, as I am, and have been strenuous objectors to President Trump, in my case, I went as far as advocating his impeachment and removal, have been seen as not just people who disagree, but as, um, as a kind of traitor, uh, as, uh, as people who have, who have committed a sort of very deep moral offense of, uh, of a kind of um, uh, faithlessness and ingratitude, and, and we're uh, and those people who are on the uh, pro-Trump side, which is the vast majority of American conservatives at the moment, um, are uh, take it very personally. Um, really, part of what we're talking about is the way everything is taken personally, and um, this manifests in a variety of ways. It manifests one in uh, what would normally or used to have been considered empirical points are now taken as statements of values and ideology. So um, does how much promise does this particular kind of treatment uh, for the coronavirus have? That's not really a philosophical question. That's an empirical question, but it's become a are you pro or anti-Trump question. And, I, and we can all, I think, come up with other way, other things that have um, uh, uh, taken on that dimension. Or um, people react less to what you are saying than to what they think people like you say. 
um, that is a kind of mental shortcut that is increasingly available in a time of political polarization. <clears throat> and of course, social media, and particularly Twitter, makes all of this worse. I do find that it is impossible for me to issue a critique of a liberal or democratic figure or idea without having 10 responses from people saying, oh yeah, well, you know, now say that about Donald Trump and his family. Um, you know, like the other day I, I made a comment about how Biden's um, uh, son Hunter had clearly cashed in on his father's political career. And somebody says, well, now do the Trump kids. Well, yeah, <laughs> that's, these things are not mutually exclusive. You ought to be able to hold both of these views in your head at the same time. <clears throat> but, uh, but everything is just uh, interpreted through a unidimensional lens and it's, uh, and it's personalized about your attitude toward this president. R Ramesh, I wanna follow up on something that Shanto uh, alluded to, um, which is the bring in race. When you came out and, and, um, and made it clear you were not gonna vote for Donald Trump, um, you were gonna vote for um, a, a third party candidate, uh, Evan McMullen, who was a former CIA official. Um, and you had a, I thought a very, um, very powerful statement um, saying that, that this was based on principle. You received comments that um, were not only ones of disagreement, but they were vitriolic and I would say, in some cases, racist. Have you found that this kind of hatred that you've described has now moved into this kind of, you know, really, um, you know, beyond the edge of what used to be considered normal politics to mm -hmm. just um, outright racism? So uh, traditionally what I, I have found that when I get uh, racist or racially inflected um, criticism, um, it has been kind of, you know, it's been sometimes from liberals, it's been sometimes um, from Buchananites, because I spent a long time criticizing Pat Buchanan and his political movement from the 90s onward. Um, in 2016, it became over well, it became much larger in volume and much more heavily from the pro-Trump right. And this mirrored what I found from other conservatives who were against Trump, but if they were if they were women, they got a lot of, of really horrifying sexist um, feedback. And if they were Jewish, it was anti-Semitic, et cetera, et cetera. Um, interestingly, a lot of that turned off just about immediately once the election ended. Uh, now, some of, you know, I, I did block some of those people or mute some of them. Um, and so maybe they're still uh, carrying on at the same level, but I just don't see them. Um, and, and, it's, and it's sort of uh, come back every once in a while um, really at moments of, uh, of political um, peril for the president. So around the time of the Charlottesville fiasco or uh, around impeachment, uh, for example. But I actually haven't found that um, to be quite as much the case um, since 2016. It just, it really seemed like somebody in Macedonia flipped a switch and, uh, and it, this was no longer felt necessary. Okay, well, that's... That's a, a small silver lining. Um, Shanta, I want to come back to you on a question that um, I think a lot of people have discussed, which is, um, are, is this pattern of um, partisan hatred, is this something, it's something we see in both parties, for sure. Um, there's no doubt Democrats uh, uh, display this as do Republicans. But do you feel that it's more of a characteristic uh, more present empirically among Republicans than Democrats? That's actually, that's somewhat of a point of contention in the academic literature. Uh, there are some people, uh, at, uh, psychologists at NYU in particular, who have been making the case that Republicans, because of you know, the conservative uh, mindset, uh, and they tend to be more authoritarian, so on and so forth, they're more likely to buy into this kind of stereotyped caricature of their opponents. But our data, the data based on the American national election studies and, and almost everything else we've done on the subject indicate that it is absolutely symmetric, that it is uh, that partisans are 
evenly matched in terms of their capacity to display animus. Uh, one side doesn't have a kind of a monopoly on it. Thank you. Um, uh, Ramesh, uh, Bloomberg News had a editorial today. Um, and the title of it was, uh, Partisan Rancor Has Never Been So Dangerous. And the editorial picks up on this theme of the partisan divide and how it's now um, spread into a hatred, a, um, a real um, animosity that's based on a, uh, an identity. Um, it's no longer tied to kind of empirics or disagreements about policy. It's, it's more intense than that. Um, yeah. and, and they, they say that um, this is going to make it even harder and more dangerous for America to control the mm. coronavirus. Do you, do you see this pattern as bogging us down at this moment as you look at the debate in Congress, as you look at the president and, and some of his interactions with states around the country? Do you see this, this partisanship, both the disagreement, but also the way it's kind of seeped into our very basic fundamental identities? Right. So, um, yeah, this, this is a process of polarization um, that has gone on, and, and, and Shanto has talked about aspects of that, I think, um, uh, very well. I, I think, you know, we tend to think of sort of mid-century, mid-20th century America as kind of a norm, even though in a lot of ways it was pretty unusual period in American history. One of the ways it was unusual is that we had a politics that was organized around economic issues. Um, and when your disagreements concern um, the minimum wage, uh, for example, it, you're going to have a different kind of politics, a different feel to politics than if your politics revolves around issues such as abortion. Uh, and so the ground of our politics shifted, it became more visceral, uh, and that created a certain kind of polarization. And now I think the polarization has sort of floated free of the ground from which it originally sprang uh, and, and has, has sort of hardened and solidified. I think in a way we should count our blessings because we could have a significantly worse polarization um, at this moment. It does seem to me that if Hillary Clinton were president, um, there would be, and, and we're imposing <clears throat> or we're behind lockdown policies, there would be a much more uniform and vociferous red state rebellion against those policies, that that would be kind of the focal point of, uh, of conservatism in a way that it isn't right now because President Trump is sort of on both sides of all the issues here. Um, and, you know, while that in some ways bespeaks failures of leadership on his part, it actually has also been kind of helpful in, uh, in muting that response um, because the sort of partisan energy doesn't quite have an outlet to go to. Um, but yeah, absolutely. When you look at the debate, not just the debate in Congress, as you mentioned, but the overall debate, when you see people who, who the, the, the two sides in each other's minds are people who want granny to die to move the stock market up, and people who are deliberately trying to destroy the economy um, because they hate America and they hate Donald Trump, right? That these are not descriptions that accurately describe almost anybody in the country, but they are what Americans look like to their fellow Americans in their mind's eyes. And, and I can't see how that could possibly be helpful. Thank you very much. Uh, that really um, um, is helpful. Shanto, uh, part of your research has really raised questions about uh, the impact of this uh, social identity uh, of partisanship with our understanding and awareness of uh, the policy debates and what's going on. In one of your articles, you said um, partisans are not only uninformed, but also misinformed and deliberately misinformed. And you go on to say that actually partisans will ignore information that might challenge their partisan identity. Apply that to the current situation with the coronavirus, which is obviously uh, a dire threat, uh, 
but also enormous uncertainty about um, uh, about the future, about um, uh, how to contain it, um, and how to move forward if there's going to be openings of various sorts. All right. So yes, misinformation is uh, is a recent phenomenon, and it's completely coincident. It coincides with this rise of animus and polarization. So in the political science, uh, uh, from the political science perspective, it's a pretty understandable phenomenon. If you have a very strong commitment to your side, to your team, if you're a Trump Republican, uh, you would like to believe uh, that we have this virus under control, uh, that you know things are gonna work out fine and that the economy can be restarted anytime, no matter, don't worry about the social distancing. So that's the kind of nature of the debate that's playing out today. It seems to me what is what is ominous about this is that these these preferences are driven not by any level of certainty over scientific uh, uh, principles or scientific data, but they're really based on this sense, this this very primitive sense of identity. Uh, so anything that's good for my side is it's got to be true, and so there is this uh, you know this just amazing battery of findings, uh, not just about uh, coronavirus, uh, they're very much in play today. Republicans, there's d good data showing that Republicans do not believe in the efficacy of uh, social distancing, Democrats do. Uh, but Republicans deny that the Russians interfered in the 2016 election. Uh, they, they believe that millions of illegals cast votes in that election and so on and so forth. So yes, we are, well, uh, misinformation has become mm -hmm. a, a huge, uh, liability uh, for the democratic process. Ramesh, you see, by the way, Shanto, my, my favorite example of this is the, is the poll finding that um, Republicans think that it's important to use force, including military force against Agrabah, uh, while um, Democrats think that we should try harder to understand them. And uh, of course, you yes. know, it's a fictional yes. kingdom. Yes. Uh, we've got a lot of questions here from folks, and I would say generally they break out into why is this pattern developing that you're both describing? Um, and let me start with one. And then the second area is, um, are there kind of um, green shoots of hope? Um, and uh, I know you're both eager to talk about that. So let me start with the, some of the questions on why is this developed? Uh, here's a question uh, from Jeffrey Peterson. If partyis partyism is driven at least in part by how the current process of nominating and electing has evolved into driving both political parties to ideological extremes. What are your thoughts about the process changing to include ranked choice voting? So I'd say those are two questions. Do you think the, the nomination process has um, encouraged kind of factions within the party and intensified the ideological and perhaps identity nature of our partisanship. Ramesh, do you want to start us off? Sure. Uh, I think that that the polarization of our country is such a large fact uh, that there are lots of things that contribute to it while being small parts of the overall picture. Um, so, for example, I mean, tangentially for here for a second, Developments in the media, I think, are both a cause and an effect of this polarization. In terms of the nomination process, I first of all, I should, should get to the bottom line question. I think that we should use more ranked choice voting. I, I think that it would be good in uh, to the, the Republican presidential process had fewer places where it was winner take all on the basis of a plurality where, you know, mm -hmm. a candidate like Donald Trump can get 35% of the South Carolina vote and get all the delegates. I think that's a mistake. I don't know if I want every state to have it, but I would like to have a little bit more of that. Um, uh, ranked choice voting is as, as a way of, um, forcing consensus building in, inside the party and outside the party. Uh, I want more of that in the mix. Um, but, you know, you can look at that. You can look at things like gerrymandering. And basically, I don't think they explain all that much. Um, people have gotten more eager to move and live among people who are like-minded with them politically to listen to one another. Um, to amp each other up. And when that happens, um, there's not a lot of sort of structural or procedural that you can do 
um, to work around it. I mean, you can do some and you should, but you, there's a hard limit on it. Yeah. Shanta, do you have a view about the way in which our, our presidential nomination process may have uh, intensified or even produced what you're describing? Yeah, I think in general, the more difficult it is to vote, the more likely you, to, you are to witness this kind of a selection bias. Uh, the people who choose to vote are no longer a representative sample of the entire country. And in fact, you know, ironically, you know, the primary movement was all driven by people with very strong democratic instincts, over case D. Uh, but of course, the impact of the primary system was a rather undemocratic, you know, 29%, 25% turnout. And the people who vote in these primaries tend to be drawn disproportionately from the ideological extreme. So yeah, I think we need to contemplate, you know, rank choice is fine, but we might even want to go the route of some other countries and require voting. Uh, and the more people you have voting and showing up, the more you're going to have the center dominating. Can, can I jump in on that? And, and I mean, Sh Shanta, I mean, I'm sure you know the, the literature better than I do, but I think that I, I don't, I'm not necessarily for mandatory voting, but it seems like the great advantage of that, the great change that would work in our politics is, is not so much that you'd have a different group of people voting, because I'm not sure that non-voters actually are all that different in their preferences from voters, but mobilization strategies wouldn't make sense anymore, right? Intensification of partisan feeling um, wouldn't matter because everybody's already voting. You don't need to get your guys to turn out. Right. No, I think that's that's absolutely critical. Uh, that that would neutralize that entire G, you know get out the vote kind of uh, emphasis during campaigns. And I'm not necessarily saying that we need to make it mandatory. I mean, we might just ease, uh, you know, make it possible for people to vote for men, you know, online voting. I mean, assuming that the security issues can. At some point, it seems to me we need to consider other ways than walking down to the polling place and casting a ballot. Yeah, I think this this is a, a point of agreement and basic point that our nomination process is tending to encourage uh, the election of more extreme candidates. And I think the, the record tends to confirm that. Let me uh, jump to another issue, um, possible explanation for why we are where we are, which is the media. And we've got several questions about that. Um, and the basic theme uh, is that there are so many um, avenues, both in terms of cable, TV, in terms of online information sources, that partisans are able to go to sources of information that confirm their existing uh, attitudes uh, and introduce a bias in how they see things and encourage just the kind of misinformation, ignorance that Chanto Iyengar has talked about. Um, Ramesh, this is your industry. Um, do you, do you think the media has played some role in this? Yeah. So, um, I mean, the media has played some role in it, but our, our readers, our viewers have played a role because those are the media that people are seeking out. That's what is being rewarded. Um, and there's also some broader economic trends, which have made the media a less secure industry and have made it more dependent on getting those clicks. Sometimes the rah, rah, rally the troop kind of clicks, sometimes hate clicks. Uh, I'm gonna say something really intentionally outrageous and provocative and so that everybody's gonna say, can you believe what this right wing nut or this left wing crazy is saying? And then it goes viral. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that that has played a role. And I think some of it is, um, and I'll, I'll, to, to get back to sort of my experience in these last couple of years um, with the Trump phenomenon, it's really striking to me how many people I know or were correspondents of mine because they read me and they'd email me or, or something. And they were, they were people who voted for Trump in 2016 with real misgivings. They had serious reservations about him. Um, they thought he was the lesser evil and so forth. But then over time, and this is my interpretation of what they're doing, over time, they having made that choice, they don't want to hear negative stuff about their guy. They don't want to have their noses, as they think of it, being rubbed in the flaws. And so they may start by saying, yeah, 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 I already know, I already know that. But over time, they start sort of sweeping it away they just want the reinforcement. I think it's a very natural human tendency. 
And, uh, and I think that's part of the reason why you've seen this phenomena in the media as well. Shanto, uh, there is uh, uh, a sentiment among Democrats that the phenomenon you're describing is a product of Fox News. Well, I don't think there's any doubt that the development of partisan outlets has contributed to this sense of, you know, tribal division. Uh, I wouldn't single out, I mean, I think Fox is a pretty extreme case, but I think nowadays, you know, with the online, with the proliferation of these partisan sites online, I can cite any number of uh, web sources that are just as bad in terms of deliberately uh, uh, sowing uh, misinformation. And it's not, as I said earlier, this is not a, a phenomenon that is exclusively based on the right. I mean, uh, we can talk about uh, Rachel Maddow and MSNBC and Lawrence O'Donnell and the Huffington Post. And so uh, I just think the proliferation of these partisan sites has made it possible for the development of these so-called echo chambers where like-minded people congregate on a daily basis to get their daily, you know, uh, to drink the Kool-Aid. And, and that I think has, has fanned the flames of partisan animus. There are a number of questions about um, how this partisan divide and animus is going to impact the next stage of how America handles the coronavirus. Um, and one, one theme is, will the spread of the virus, the increasing number of people who get ill, get sick, the spread into uh, red states, rural areas, will this increase um, a, a reassessment among uh, the kind of liberationists who have challenged uh, governors? Uh, will it moderate President Trump's um, calls for uh, governors to uh, open their economy quicker than they might? Ramesh, what do you think? Do you, do you think there's going to be an awakening? Well, I mean, it, this depends on the, the future course of the virus. Um, and uh, even the epidemiologists have not been able to um, pin that down completely and they disagree among one another. So I'm certainly not going to have it down. Uh, I do think that you run into a kind of paradox of preemption, which is that um, the more successful your extreme methods of containing um, this disaster are, the less necessary they look uh, and um, the more they look like overreactions. So that is a problem. Um, it'll, it, these, me these methods will look better the worse they perform. Um, Shanto, I'm very interested in your response to this because your uh, research and analysis suggests that our ability for learning about policy that would challenge our partisan mindsets is very, very limited. And so just to extend what Ramesh said, do you think if we have, you know, as the number of deaths go up, number of cases go up, and the illness spreads, you know, more widely in the country, do you think this is going to lead to some sort of change in the way Republicans are thinking and the way they're seeing Democrats? I would certainly hope so. I would hope so. So the pandemic has been concentrated in urban areas, that's a blue, blue state strongholds, and that perhaps explains why you've got this big partisan divide on the efficacy of distancing. Uh, my hunch is, again, I agree with Ramesh, I mean, we don't know what these models of the assumptions are all, you know, all over the place, but assuming that states like, like Iowa and South Dakota and Georgia have very large outbreaks and large scale, uh, God forbid, large scale uh, fatalities, I would think that the Republicans will that that would, in a sense, contribute to a more um, a sort of a, a greater sense of agreement on what needs to be done uh, to fight the virus. I mean, it's tragic that it might require that kind of you know scale of event to, uh, to bring this about, but that's my hunch. Yeah, um, I want to move on to many questions about how the heck do we get out of this mess. Um, and um, knowing both of you, I'm not expecting a whole lot of kumbaya uh, from you, but if you give us some insights, um, Ramesh, let me ask you uh, uh, one of these questions, which is, are there a few Democrats and Republicans 
who you think of as having uh, the courage and the ability to cross party lines um, and to address uncomfortable issues for their tribe? So I think that it's less a question of there being particular leaders because frankly, not a lot of people are standing out to me uh, in that regard than it is particular issues. So, uh, and the, there are places where bipartisan cooperation is possible and constructive reforms can be undertaken. Now, they tend to be places which are not front burner issues, which are relatively low in political salience. That's why you can have left-right cooperation on criminal justice reform in a way you couldn't during the crime wave, right? You couldn't have had that in the same way um, in the 1980s, uh, or at least it would have taken a very different form back then. It's why you can ha you have this maybe budding left-right coalition on um, reigning in the excesses of occupational licensing. And so one place, I would look for hope in sort of building and nurturing and working on those areas and trying to use them as a basis maybe for larger scale cooperation because people get into the habit of working together. Shanto, you've written about the fact that uh, Washington and our state capitals are very divided between the Republicans and Democrats. But when you actually look at polling, of everyday Americans on policy issues, they're closer together. Um, what explains that? What, what, why do we have these two different stories? Well, this is, uh, so the, the, the debate over ideological polarization has been raging in the political science discipline now for half a century. We have some folks who think that the Democrats and Republicans have all become extremists. I'm talking about rank and file. Uh, Democrats and Republicans, but the survey data, as you suggest, show a very different picture. The survey data show that people are congregating towards the center. Uh, there's far more people in the center than there are at the two extremes, and that's, that's sort of a paradox, uh, because the political elites have, of course, gravitated to the extremes. And so you've got this disconnect between, you know, Schumer and Pelosi and McConnell uh, representing people who are not that extreme. And, and that gets back to that earlier point about the selection process, you know, the overrepresentation of extremists in primaries, the big donors, and so on and so forth. But I think the ideological disconnect, that does not necessarily mean that you still can't have this deep sense of identity and tribalism. Uh, so one doesn't require the other. So this is a very fundamental point that you're making, which is on policy, Americans, all of us, are actually closer than you would imagine looking at Washington and the state capitals. But the divide and the hatred that we're, we've been talking about is propelled by this fundamental identity in politics, but also extends into who we marry and who we date and where we live and even some of the products we buy and use. Exactly. It's, a, it's like a party has become a litmus test. It's telling you something about the character of the individual, not necessarily something about the person's policy preferences. Ramesh, a uh, question here about voting and um, the, uh, the charge that Republicans are getting elected because of voter suppression um, and now the, the opposition to vote by mail. And that may be contributing to partisan polarization and the rancor because Republicans aren't playing fair or abiding by uh, voting law. Yeah, so um, issues around elections and election law certainly have become a source of contention between the parties. Um, and there are obvious differences uh, on their issue stance. I actually don't think that that has been in the past, although that could change. Um, a major source of the polarization. That is to say, the polarization was pretty well advanced before this became as defining an issue for the parties um, as it is becoming. It is more, I think, that the polarization of the parties is creating the energy in this issue. That is, um, first of all, the stakes on who wins elections seem to be higher when it's somebody you've defined as 
totally the other team and the bad guys and they have to be stopped at any cost. And it sort of adds to the idea that, um, you know, that they're, they're winning by illegitimate means, right? They're, they're bad people and all of their victories are illegitimate. Now, I, I'm a little bit, I, I have become more sympathetic to the democratic issue positions on these issues. Uh, and um, I think particularly in the context of this year, vote by mail is, is probably gonna end up making a lot of sense. Um, the idea that, it, that it's gonna change a lot of election outcomes uh, though, I think is not terribly well-founded. Right, you can imagine, for instance, in Florida and elsewhere, where the Republicans have an advantage among older Americans, if you don't have vote by mail, Republicans could end up losing voters who will be particularly reluctant to go stand in line and perhaps be exposed to the coronavirus. There, there's a long history of parties getting their sort of even short-term partisan interest wrong. Like when Democrats thought admitting Alaska was going to be big boon to them. And so they had to, uh, and Republicans insisted that you had to bring in Hawaii too. Uh, and of course, ended up being totally the reverse of what people thought. Thank you for that nugget. That's terrific. Um, Shanto, there's been a lot of um, uh, discussion both in kind of the, uh, the good government world and among some of our political science colleagues about would civic education, could we bring into K to 12 education more understanding about how the process works, try to kind of nip in the bud this rancor and hostility between the parties. Do you see any hope in that direction? Oh, I'm glad, I'm glad that question came up uh, because that's, we're in the process right now. We have just done a survey, a national survey of middle school kids. And so we wanted to map, you know, to what extent is this rancor being transmitted across generations? You wouldn't, expre you wouldn't expect young kids to be already hating their opponents. Unfortunately, I have to tell you that the data are quite depressing. Uh, they indicate that there's almost no difference between kids' animus and parents' animus. I was really kind of shocked by that result. That, that fits with uh, decades of research about political socialization that, that starting at a young age, you know, it's like you teach your kids how to brush their teeth. Well, you also teach them what's the right party to support. Yeah, it's well, like uh, it's like that line from South Pacific. You've got to learn to hate the people. <laughs> I I find that when my nine year old asks me questions about politics, as she increasingly does, the questions that she's asking are basically of the form: Do we like this person? Do we not like this person? Is he a good person or a bad person? And I try to say, well, you know, this is a person. You know, we we like a lot more of this person's ideas and fewer of that person's ideas and not to put it in those terms, but it's a very natural framing for people. Um, Shanto, despite your survey findings, which I, I had heard about and, um, and I'm glad you did the study, there is this kind of good government view that if we changed, uh, particularly uh, elementary school uh, education to bring back civics, and, and kind of restore the teaching of civic values and an understanding of the political process, that that might create or start to build up this muscle mass of, of a baseline civic understanding of, for instance, uh, that the government is not an evil plot, that, that there are decent people in both political parties, that, that we have a long tradition of disagreeing without um, you know, ripping each other apart. Oh, I, 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 I tend to agree with that. I, I think that the real threat here is not so much the idea that the Democrats and Republicans don't like each other, but what are the consequences for the body politic? What about democratic norms? What about this norm of you know, tolerance, uh, being able to put up with people who you disagree with who might be critical of your, your point of view? I think those are critical, and I think you're right. I think uh, to, the, to the extent that we can strengthen the foundations of these norms by 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 you know sort of exposing kids at a very early age to the importance of dissent and things like that and the value of participation, yeah, the, the more the better. Ramesh, do I hear? Uh, what what are your views? I I uh, I hate to uh, to add to the pessimism. I was just reminded. I was just thinking of how 
Um, I had participated in talk about polarization and what we should do to overcome it. And afterwards, uh, a relative, um, or actually I'd written about this and a relative responded basically, you are <coughs> so right. They are so bitter and intolerant, <laughs> right? <laughs> that uh, it's just really, really hard to, uh, to overcome that mindset. One of the big debates uh, has been about uh, rising economic inequality. Uh, we've just come through a democratic primary process that, um, that made that central, both economic and racial uh, disparities. That debate is uh, bubbling again as we watch the coronavirus strike uh, many more people of color than, than, um, than whites. Is, is inequality a major driver of the partisan divide and the partisan rancor that we're seeing? Shanta, do you want to start us off? Well, it's a tough one. Uh, I, I'm not sure that I would go so far as to say that, uh, that the rising the gap between the rich and the poor has contributed to, to this notion of partisan um, animus. In a sense, it has, because the two political parties have become more well sorted on the socioeconomic status dimension. Uh, so, you know, uh, there are very few uh, poor Republicans out there. And they're very, well, there are still, certainly if you come out of Silicon Valley, there are quite a few affluent, <laughs> affluent Democrats, but let's leave that aside. But I think the more, uh, the inequality has, has manifested itself more notably within the ranks of the Democrats. And you're seeing that play out in terms of the Green New Deal, the Sanders movement and all of that. And so I think if anything, it has contributed to, to more sort of uh, you know, a fracturing of the left uh, than it has uh, to, uh, on the left-right divide. Ramesh, I, I know um, from having read you that uh, you have a great deal of respect for Ronald Reagan. And one of the things that Republicans have said about Ronald Reagan, and I think there's some truth to it, is that he had a disagreement over the means, but there was a concern among Reagan Republicans about poverty. You had Jack Kemp going to, you know, repeatedly to um, conferences with people of color and going to very poor neighborhoods and poor, putting forward real policies. Um, that seems less prevalent mm -hmm. in the Republican Party today. And so I'm wondering, do you see some merit in the, um, the criticism of the Republican Party for not taking inequality more seriously? And could that be a factor in, in widening inequality, or excuse me, widening partisan disagreement? Well, I think that um, there have been times when Republicans have had more or less focus on uh, fighting poverty and promoting opportunity. I mean, th one thinks of George W. Bush's compassionate conservatism, um, for example. Uh, I, what role inequality plays is, is a very tricky question to tease out. I think you'd need to um, distinguish between on the one hand, the gap between the rich and the poor, and on the other hand, the question of whether people in the middle are progressing. These are related questions, but they're distinct questions. And it may be that in a society where most people are progressing, um, but you've also got a big gap, um, that there's still a fair amount of contentment and there's less of a tendency to go to toward the extremes. I mean, I think that there's just a lot of stuff you'd want to unpack there. I do think that part of what is going on, and we've alluded to this in various forms already during this conversation, is that uh, our coalitions are becoming less and less about policy and more about cultural signification. There's always a symbolic element in politics, but it's really struck me the last few years the extent to which our politics is just about things like how football players are spending their halftime um, and all of the things that this, you know, reflects uh, as opposed to, well, what is the government going to do and what's it not going to do and how is it going to do those things? Um, and uh, that I think is absolutely a key part of polarization. Again, both a cause and an effect. We are out of time. Um, I want to just make a few closing um, uh, uh, comments. One, if you have enjoyed this program or like to share it, it is recorded. 
and we will be sending around the information where you can find that. Uh, please spread the word. Uh, we've got a number of programs coming up. I've mentioned some, um, and I think the uh, vote uh, by mail, if you're interested in knowing more about that, this is gonna be a great program. Vin Weber and Anna Greenberg coming up on May 19th. We've got several programs on the health insurance system and what, to be, what can be done about that uh, as we move through the coronavirus. Um, I wanna particularly uh, take a moment to thank uh, my staff who've organized this. Um, and there's a lot of work that went into this. Lee Chittenden is the uh, general in charge. Thank you very much, Lee Chittenden. Mike Carey is uh, the uh, foot soldier who makes this all happen and got all of us together. We are grateful to you, Mike, thank you. Kate Connors is the person that makes sure that the technology works and it did. Thank you, Kate. Um, also wanna take a moment to uh, say if you've enjoyed what you've heard for Shento Yangar and Mesh Ponaru, they're both prolific authors. Google them, it is worth your time. Uh, Ramesh writes regularly for Bloomberg News. I read his column all the time. It's part of my circuit. Um, and Shanto Yengar is one of the most influential political science scientists on the issue of partisanship, uh, political communications for many years. Um, and you can find his writing as well. Thank you to both of you. This has been really a terrific conversation and I'm grateful that you joined us. Thank you and Thank thanks you. to all of you who joined us. Thank you.